Uh, we hope that many of you watching this will be new friends of Shaker Museum. We are excited to be for making new friends ourselves this summer, as well as forming partnerships with businesswomen and artists like Hannah Hayworth and Jordana Monk-Martin, whose work aligns with the core of Shaker values, with the core values of the Shakers, community, inclusion, innovation, integrity, and conviction. If this is the first time you've ever heard of the Shakers, we hope that you will take the time to explore our website at shakermuseum.us. There you can search and explore the world's most comprehensive collection of Shaker art objects and artifacts. The Shakers were formerly known as the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, and they were one of the most intriguing and influential religious social movements in American history. Governed equally by men and women, the Shakers welcomed the disenfranchised, raised and educated orphans, and created large-scale successful businesses, and readily shared their resources with those in need. To the extent that it was possible and practical, Shaker communities were self-sufficient, both because they chose to live apart from the world and because it was frugal and efficient to do so. Sustainability in a thriving Shaker village would have been expressed as the right use of resources. Nothing would have been wasted. Artifacts and records from the collection demonstrate the Shaker's attention to making best use and extending the useful life of the physical gifts they received from the creator. Clothing, equipment, and even buildings no longer in use would have been mended, shared, dismantled, or repurposed. Fair trade is not really a direct Shaker concept, but it resonates deeply with the Shaker entrepreneurism, the integrity for which the Shakers were known, and the respect for the crafts which they strove to achieve perfection in every day. Um, a quick bit about the museum. We are a 501c3 and our annual operating budget is generated entirely through donat donations and memberships. Uh, the summer series is a new fundraising format for us, replacing the pre-COVID uh, pre gala format with a slate of in-person and online events, which offers people numerous opportunities to learn about the Shakers, the museum and all that we offer, and to support us at whatever financial level is accessible. So we thrive and exist because of your support. So thank you so much for being here. We're very grateful. Um, and so to business, I'm gonna do quick introductions and then let Hannah and Jordana really tell us mostly about themselves. Um, but to begin, Hannah Hayworth is a Scottish artist living and working in New York. Her work has been featured in publications such as Vogue and the New York Times. And we are thrilled that she designed the field bag knitting kit for us to help us celebrate the summer series and that's available on the Summer Series website. Hannah started Handa Textiles in 2015 as a way to market textiles from the indigenous village she grew up in in the Philippines. She has since expanded to include handmade and natural textiles from many different people and places. Jordana Monk Martin is the founder of Tatter, an organization dedicated to the examination and celebration of the essential role of cloth in human life. She is the former board president of the Textile Arts Center in Brooklyn, New York, as well as the founder of its Artist in Residence program. Previously, Jordana served as a trustee of the Craft and Folk Art Museum in Los Angeles, now known as Craft Contemporary. Tatter and its textile library, Blue, have been featured in Vogue Knitting, Martha Stewart Living, Knitwit, and the World of Interiors. So thank you both so much for being here. If we didn't have everybody muted, you could hear them all clapping enthusiastically. And um, I'm gonna kick it over to Hannah to tell us more about how you've come to do this interesting work. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Susie. It's so good to be here. Um, I'm gonna start with a little screen share and show you some images. So, and... Great. There we go. Um, so to go right to the beginning of my textile journey, uh, when my family was three, we all moved to the Philippines. Um, my parents were working for a nonprofit, and my mom um, was assigned to provide primary health care for a really small community. Um, that was kind of chosen for her by the organization uh, on the island of Mindoro in the Philippines. It's a bit of a hike in, it's isolated, there's no running water or electricity, and 
a lot of the life there is handmade. The houses, the tools, the clothes. Um, here in this picture, you can see a little bit of the setting. So it's deep in kind of the mountains, this jungle, rainforest all around. And then the, there's little communities within that. Um, yeah, here's the view from uh, our house growing up. You can see it's pretty far from a lot. <laughs> um, so growing up there was just uh, life as I knew it and being part of that culture and being with the people there was, you know, my everyday friends and family and it uh it's I don't know I suppose it's changed in recent visits it's started to get a little bit more um influenced I suppose by the the lowland culture the Tagalog there's like more stuff coming in like a few of the houses have electricity now there's um, motorcycles and karaoke machines, stuff like that, um, which they didn't used to be. But there's still a very strong culture of making cloth there, um, which is typically, let's see, it's me and my brother in our house from childhood. Yeah, so this is a village. You can see the houses and how they're made. And this is Ate Adeling, a friend of ours growing indigo to dye cotton with. Um, so the traditional cloth there is made on backstrap looms and it's blue and white with traditional motifs through it. And it's used for clothing, for blankets and as baby carriers. So when I was little, we got gifted by our neighbors a lot of these items um which is really special like i have here wait how do i stop the share for a minute okay um i have one of these little blouses which is made from like back in the day it would have been a homespun hand woven situation with the cotton but this one's actually made from feed sacks um, I don't know if you can see the writing on it that was then embroidered in the traditional thread. The pattern. But I have a few things like that that really became dear to me and things that I have taken with me wherever. Um, and let's go back to my. Yeah, this is a backstrap loom, just in case any of you haven't seen one before. And this is Ate Mayang uh, weaving on it. Um, so yeah, this cloth, kind of unbeknownst to me at the time, really became like the, the cloth of my life. And um, once we moved back to my native Scotland when I was a teenager, um, I had a few pieces that I took with me and eventually I moved to the US and took those pieces with me too. And I was working in the city, uh, New York City and would sometimes like figure wearing them to work and stuff like that. And um, it got to the point where people would ask me where things were from. Oh, where could I get something like that? Um, and then it stemmed from there to me writing them. And, you know, it's like such a process because it's not really a postal service and all of that. <laughs> but somehow getting in touch and uh, asking if they were up for selling some textiles. And they were like, yeah, of course. That's so cool that, you know, people are interested. And um, so I got a few and sold them. And then I got a few more. And then I was like, this is a really great thing. I can start 
helping more and it's like also a cool way for me selfishly I can like visit all my friends again here and there um so I started kind of importing textiles and a few baskets too that are traditional um to the Mangyan uh and selling them here because there was just more of a market and yeah so through doing that it was kind of all that I did for a few years with Handa. And then recently I started thinking about other communities and, um, oh wait, here is, you can see the traditional skirts on the women. This is Anita, my friend, uh, wearing like a kind of green version. She got with some cotton she got at the market. Um, and then on the left is a lot of the, weavers at Handa, they, they're they all like people, our family has known forever, like our neighbors and godmother and like all of that. So let's see. And this is some of the cloth up close. You can really see some of the detail in it. They all have little um, different motifs depending on the family that's making them. That one's called Hao. A lot of the cloth I get given has a little like H if you look closely at the weave because it would be like, they like taking your name and making it a logo. <laughs> it's just like a fun thing <laughs> everyone does. Um, so yeah, that's like the Hannah one. Let's see. Yeah, so then this last year or so, I started looking out other communities like the Mangyan. Um, that do a lot of handiwork and maybe don't have a direct market where they're working um, and working on getting in touch and then offering it here at Handa and just providing kind of like a, a place where you can go and buy handmade yardage from communities around the world that don't have that to offer yet on their own. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where I've gotten to now with it. Uh, so I'll let, I'll let Susie uh, introduce Jordana now. I'm gonna to pass it right on and let her tell us, tell us all about it. You've got to unmute though. Me? Oh. No, Jordana has to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. <laughs> so used to keeping myself muted. Um, well, hi, everyone. And um, Hannah, that was amazing, like armchair, armchair travel. Um, I'm such a cloth nerd, and I love those, those blue textiles so much. Um, Susie, thank you so much for having me here. I'm beyond grateful to be um, in any way associated with Shaker Ethos. Um, I find the Shakers totally fascinating. And also, I wanted to say thank you to Hannah for facilitating this talk and bringing me into this community. I am um, really inspired by your business and the way that you work, and I, I like our friendship so much. Um, so I, I feel so much like the ethos of the Shakers was expressed in the timeless, very refined, minimalist design that they um, worked on so so diligently every day. And so um, like I'm about to take you on a tour of my library, which is in no way minimalist, it's maximalist. And so I feel a little cringy, like the overdressed girl at the party. So you'll have to excuse that. Um, but let me share a screen and take you to the library. Did that work? Am I sharing? Yeah. Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, well, here we are in the Tatter Blue Library. I welcome all of you to your virtual visit. Um, the mission of Tatter is to explore and celebrate the endlessly incredible role of cloth in human life. Cloth is our chosen skin. 
and we're wrapped in it from the moment that we're born and then it's never far from us. So um, I, it's it's been a lifelong passion for me to explore the different ways that we interact with it and it accompanies us in so many profound ways. Um, Tatter Library opened its doors publicly in 2017 and we became a 501c3 in 2020. Um, previous to that, the collection was simply my books and that of my grandmother's and it was in service to the artist residency at Textile Arts Center, which I founded um, the residency, not the center. Um, and um, in 2017, I decided to make it a place of public research. Um, we are home to over 6,000 books and textile related objects, periodicals, exhibition catalogs, and um, we are a visual resource as well as a fully functioning research space. Um, how I began, really, I'm going to introduce you to my grandmother, Edith Wiley, pictured on the left, who founded the Craft and Folk Art Museum in the 1960s. Um, my grandmother was absolutely enamored with folk art, which is not so much a term that we use today. Um, but folk art for her, she considered an organic act of human creativity that was generally made outside of conventional Western education and um, expressed a function and a culture and a pathway to human experience and story. So she was a very early connector for me. Um, she developed in me a huge love of objects and the stories that they hold. And I entirely credit her with how I got where I am today. Um, that's her self-portrait that hangs in the library. She's a bit of a, um, like, a goddess in the library. Um, so we are a mix of books and objects that live together. We really feel like objects animate the books and the information that is within them. And the objects help us connect to the tactile information that's enclosed there. We have garments, we have fragments, we have tools. Um, all of them are, it's quite diverse, sometimes a little bit random. We acquire things, people donate all of the time. And um, we're very proud when we receive donation because I think that people really realize this is a space that really celebrates legacy and the importance of the objects in the donor's life. And as we begin to acquire new kinds of objects, we've been able to develop the ways in which we photograph those objects, the way we talk about them, the way we program from them. In 2018, we launched um, a project called the Barbara Walker Knitting Project. And this was an effort to really celebrate how every book in the library is enduring and relevant and sometimes somebody's life's work. Barbara Walker published this book in the 1960s and is a self-taught knitter. There was no stitch dictionary at the time and she wanted more information about knitting. So she decided to take it upon herself and write the book. And these aspects of especially women's history and textiles is very compelling for us. And so we invited our community to participate in volunteering to knit swatches from the book, which were assigned. And the project really blossomed into, uh, was it maybe 450 knitters from 14 countries that volunteered to knit for us. And there are about 550 patterns in the book. So um, it was the first time that we took a book from our shelf and decided to really engage the community in some kind of effort. And I think that was like very defining for us at the time. Today, um, the library has more than five women's collections. I have five of them represented here and they're quite diverse in what these women focused on in their lives. They are different aspects of textile history. We've been kind of lucky to come upon a unique collection every time and um, it's made a really 
rich, dense academic collection of books that speaks to the lives that these women lived. Um, so when, when COVID happened, we were forced to really ask ourselves, well, what are we if we're not a room of books? Because the library was closed and we wanted to continue programming and engaging with our community. So we developed a speaker series. These are three, um, three of our past speakers from the past year. And it was amazing to see our community grow giantly from small book events and personal research appointments to lectures that accommodated hundreds of people. We also got very introspective and decided to launch a journal, a digital journal, and it's themed. You're looking at our first two issues on the left. We themed isolation because that was the condition that we were in. And then we focused on earth for this. That's what's currently up on the website. And I do think that the materiality of, of earth and the subject matter that we're engaging with there is, is um, resonant with our talk tonight. So I hope you'll go and take a look if you have time and interest. And we really also alongside the speaker series and the, and the digital journal, we wanted to bring the tactility of the library into people's homes. And so we deepened our efforts in workshops um, so that we could engage with materials um, tactily. Oops. Um, the thing about materials is it's the, the beginning of using them is how we really feel we develop a consciousness about where things came from, what their history is, how we might use them, and then where that can lead us in making and using them to the human story that we put in as we engage with them. It also helps to create consciousness about where the materials came from, the people who made them for us. Um, and so we've taken on like kind of a growing conversation in hand sewing. Hand sewing for us is an act um, outside of the machine when you abandon your sewing machine, if you have one. It's such an empowering thing to sew something by hand the way that we used to do it and to learn how strong your garment can be. And so we're doing now long form classes that are months long. They create a real community around a garment. We learn about the history of that garment. For example, on the left here, this is our historical hand sewn shirt class garment. This was a garment worn across classes, genders even made by everyone for everyone in the time. And um, going through the motions of making this garment is how you connect to the people that made and wore this garment at the time that it was being worn. So it's kind of a fascinating process to embody that history through making. And we are now slowly embarking on a conversation in retail and providing products for our makers and trying to describe these materials with the history behind them so that we can deepen that experience. It's like very much the effort of Tatter to create consciousness about cloth and where that all the good things that that can lead us to. So it's tactile, it's visual, beautiful. And we have retail partnerships with like-minded brands like 1111 Clothing. We developed a yarn with them earlier this year um, made of indigenous fiber of cotton. I'll talk more about that later. But brands like this are also connecting these dots between materials, resources, the landscape, what's in your garment, who made it, often like the garments pictured here, zero waste so that you know, nothing is wasted. And it's really education for us. That's the epicenter of what we do. This is how we feel like we are making a community around a conversation and hopefully impacting positively people's lives. So that's that. That is my tour of the library.
You need to unmute. Now I'm unmuted, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It is so helpful to know where you guys come from because it's so, to think about the origins of fabric is um, really kind of foreign to those of us who sort of just have been living in the mainstream and taking it for granted. Um, and I know that we've talked before, and one of the things that's really important to this conversation um, is to define terms a little bit. So I wonder if you guys um, could tell us a little bit what it means to you for something to be fair trade or sustainable, and what are the other terms we should know about and think about? Hannah, you want to go for it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like in... Um, Jordana and I were talking earlier about the connection between food and cloth and just consuming in general and how as a culture here in the US, we're getting used to seeing fair trade and organic on our food and thinking about like, oh, well, if I'm buying meat, where's that from? And if, you know, what's being sprayed on this that I'm putting in my body? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a really, um, it's just a useful place to come from when looking at textiles too. You can really kind of apply the same uh, ideals. Um, for me, fair trade is like, it's less about having a fair trade label on your brand or having um, like a sticker or something like that. It's not really, I feel like cloth is like not as easily readable like that as food is, but just having a consciousness about where you're getting it from, what are the dyes, what's your fabric content on the label. Um, and if you have any doubts, there's like so much you can do to find out. Um, I think especially with like the Instagram culture, which has been really great is having that direct line to brands and being able to ask questions if you have them and figure it out. It's just gotten so much easier with the internet. Um, but for me, fair trade just means you're not, you know, you're not exploiting. Um, you're, you're buying with consciousness, you're taking, like, for instance, if I were to, you know, purchase cloth from the manga, and I know that I'm getting something that people have enjoyed making and gotten like, you know, for them, it's like a it's a passed down tradition and something really beautiful that they get to share. And that's so important to keep in mind. It's something that we think about for ourselves a lot when we're making stuff, but to keep that in mind for those that are making products that we buy too, it's really, really a good way to think about it as a kind of starting place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, fair trade is so limited really in, in actual certification, mostly to food and very few commodities. So it's it's a great term to like bring up because then it makes you think, well, there must be a whole lot of unfair trade and what does that mean? And because we outsource so much manufacturing in this country, we aren't aware of how things are made. And if we aren't aware of how things are made, it paves the road to a very opaque supply chain and we don't even know what kind of exploitation is happening wherever the product is, is being cultivated and produced. And we also, in not knowing how things are made, we don't know the resources required of our earth to even produce them. So um, trying to educate a little bit about this, just so that you can make a more informed decision, I think it's really, really important. And um, what, I think is a little bit different for Hannah and myself is that we are, we're actually taking this conversation to makers. So consumers are now interested in what goes in their body. Sometimes they're interested in what goes on their body and if it's healthy and if it's well-made and, and um, made fairly. Um, but it's, it's the maker community that I think is like so ripe for activism because they really enjoy engaging in, in those materials and making themselves. And so I think we're trying to provide for makers options that have been researched um, that can really add to the joy and the experience of making something. Um, but you also brought up 
sustainability. And um, actually we talked a little bit about before about regional textiles, which is a totally new area in the conversation of sustainable clothing. Um, so we should talk about that a little bit. And sustainability has so much more to do with the resources that are required to produce things uh, at the scale of the demand that humans want them. And unfortunately, like that demand is really skewed. And so the consequences on earth and global warming and climate change are really dire. I do think it makes sense when you talk about the makers being the most ripe for being attuned to this because it, it, it relates closely to slow fashion or the concept of maybe we don't need so much or so many or to have a new thing all the time, but we can have something that is special and is enduring and maybe that becomes uh, something that's fashionable and desirable instead. Mm, totally. um, I like what you said also about the resources and sustainable. So by the time things get to the consumers, whether you're a maker or somebody shopping for clothing, what kind of factors go into making something sustainable or a responsible purchase, like in terms of regional regional textiles or, or how big a carbon footprint is, what kind of factors go into that? Um, I'm not, sorry, I'm not sure I fully follow like. So what kind of like, what kind of factors, there's the, um, not only where is it made, but how far does it travel? What is it dyed with? How, uh, how do these, all these factors play into what it means in the final product? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's pretty hard to have all the things unless you're doing it all yourself, which, you know, people do and it's awesome too. But um, yeah, I think a really important thing to consider is toxins with um, fabric, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of, I guess a lot of textile manufacturing happens in parts of the world that, um, don't have a lot of laws in place for kind of the health of the people making it and the health of the planet. It's more focused on like trying to keep up with the crazy demand that we're putting on them for um, cheap and available and masses and masses of this stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, chemical dyes have like a huge effect. Uh, synthetic fabrics have a huge effect on the planet. Even if you're buying something second hand that's synthetic every time you put it through the wash those like fibers are getting flushed out and they're finding them in the ocean and it's just like a a pretty devastating thing to get into there's a lot a lot a lot of um of sad that you can share on this subject but I think the I think you know like a big part of of looking at your footprint and your stuff. I mean, is just kind of checking on your, like organic cotton has so much less chemicals to produce mm -hmm. it. A regular cotton is like a super harsh process. Um, natural dyes are really major. It's not really possible to get everything natural dyed. I feel like it's kind of very much still a niche, even though it is getting more popular. Um, but dyeing with plants and using traditional methods like that is, is huge in terms of saving <laughs> on the planet and on people as well. Um, when people are working with these dyes all day it's like this horrible exposure that they're then taking home to their families and it just you know that's just on like a local level and these factories too are in places often that are more impacted by global warming um you know like a lot of the cities don't have infrastructure for the natural disasters that are taking place and um yeah it just it becomes a cycle that I think is really important to break with your choices. Is it possible, do you think, for natural dyes to be able to be used at a scale that they could replace chemical dyes? Or do we need new things to happen for that to be possible? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Mm -hmm. I don't. I think our consuming habits have to change and that's gonna affect the demand and the scale. 
uh, also, if we can build awareness about textile disposal, I think that would be a bigger help. I mean, there's so many factors that come into play here and so much of it is like big companies lining pockets and bottom lines. Um, those kinds of priorities don't put the earth first um, or the artisans first. So there's something going on there, but then designers and producers of garments need to put disposal in with the design process because as um, as you'll learn if you go to websites like Fiber Shed, for example, you'll learn like textiles are part of the soil cycle and there's not, there's not actually a way to throw a textile away. There's no such thing as a way. We're always on the planet and if you don't want it anymore, it's going somewhere. Where is it going? It's going to a landfill. If it's synthetic, it's never going to break down. So, um, and possibly it's getting shipped to um, a third world country and affecting their economy over there. And so there's there's endless like sad, yeah, as, as Hannah like described it. Um, if you consume with the idea of like, okay, what am I gonna do with this when I'm no longer gonna use it? Just ask yourself that, then, you know, perhaps you won't buy it or um, you'll make a different kind of choice. We have one of our hand sewing instructors who likes to ask the question, like, can you bury your garment in a forest? It's a great question to ask yourself, like, would you feel good about burying that in a forest? And if so, like, great you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. yeah. I will say, as f just going back to the dyes real quick with your question about like, yeah, natural dyes are really, you know, hard to, it's hard, you know, there's some specific brands doing stuff with natural dyes that you can find and all of that. But one thing I do that's like a slight cheat is if I am shopping or looking at something that's synthetic, like say I'm buying a t-shirt, Mm -hmm. And there's different options. If you can find like the natural or the ichor or something, that's generally a lot less chemicals involved in making it than even like the bleached white or the dyed options. So it's just like a little thing you can do. I mean, you're not gonna save the planet with that, but it's gonna help a little bit. Um, I think it sounds like such an overwhelming thing that it's, that's yeah. definitely for all of us living it, progress over perfection is maybe an important step, right? We can do the it's things. A little something you can do. A yeah. little something, lots of little somethings, perhaps. Um, someone asked about, um, let me go back. Something popped up that looked quite relevant and timely here. Um, I read that metal mordants are used for natural dyes as well as a ton of water waste. Is that true? Like, so is any dyeing, so any dyeing has some cost for the earth. Is that the? Sure. I mean, some mordants are better than others. And there are some like heavy, like more intense, like on the, it was something I thought about a lot when I started, I occasionally naturally dye yarn for fun and like some clothes and stuff like that, just for personal mm -hmm. use. And it's something I grappled with as I was making decisions to do more natural than synthetic and all of that. And a uh, dyer I know, I spoke with a lot. She does all plant dyes and has a garden where she grows everything for dyeing and she's fantastic. But she was telling me that, um, for instance, like alum, which is a really common mordant, is generally like a pretty, even though it's a metal, like metals are natural. And if you're doing kind of small quantities on a home level, it's definitely much less uh, wasteful than using a synthetic dye um, and it's something that you find in the earth naturally so you know if you're doing your dyes like here and there once in a while a little bit of alum is really not like the um, you don't have to worry about it <laughs> too much you know well, scale, it's some, scale yeah. is an important piece of everything yeah scale right? is important and then also just like the level of what you're using it's like it's a pure thing it's not a synthetically made um chemical which is i think really important to note too and then as far as water waste it really depends on the dye you're using like some dyes don't require too much 
other dyes might require a lot. And then beyond the dye, there's the processing and like what kind of effect are you achieving and all of that. But I think, yeah, it's it's a really cool thing to be aware of where you're where you are doing it and how much water is available. Um, just common sense stuff. That reminds me a little bit about, um, I don't know if we ever defined um, regional textiles. Jordana, you and I talked a little bit about that. Do you want to tell us what that means? Um, yeah, there are some people now in the space that are developing regional systems of textile production. So that would, for example, be like the upstate New York fiber shed where different farms, fiber producing farms are connected together and brought to markets together by, um, by facilitators. Uh, and, and the products that they're making are being made available to designers so that designers can obtain the materials to make their collections at a smaller scale, but regionally. So there isn't a lot of shipping, um, trucking and flying of, of our products like around the world in order to get the exact thing that we want. And if you go more deeply into, okay, what is being produced locally? What can I do with this product? It's, it's challenging and super creative at the same time. It's supporting a local economy and um, it's reducing the carbon footprint in general. And also these kinds of products that these fiber sheds are trying to educate about like wool are biodegradable. They sequester carbon. When you raise sheep, you, you sequester carbon. And this is what we need to do to, to raise things in a more climate beneficial way to, reserve, to reverse some of what's been going on in, in the damage to the globe. Um, we made a, I mean, I think it's a, a really, it's a great thing to just learn about this because it's an option. We made a yarn with a company in India. So that is not a regional product. Um, and so here I think is like an important thing of saying, okay, I'm going to educate myself and I'm going to make decisions within the options that are more informed and better. So we gave up regional and we went with we went with a place that's raising an indigenous fiber, an indigenous cotton, because once you realize like the cotton that is producing most of the world's t-shirts is not indigenous, so it requires so much water just to raise the plant. If you use an indigenous cotton, it's rain fed, it's naturalized into the landscape. You don't have to add any extra water. It's coming from two rainfalls in one year and the plant thrives. If you can spin that fiber, um, and produce a product with it, you, you do, you give up um, having it be nearby, but you make the gain in some other way. So it's maybe more understanding holistically what all of the elements are that go into raising that carbon footprint and deciding like, what's your strategy going to be in reducing it. Mm -hmm. So helpful. So helpful. So interesting when you get a sense of how how many options there are and how broad the industry is. Um, and I also promised to keep an eye a little bit on the time as we were doing this. And I think we're getting to the point where um, if Kathleen, who is our helpful uh, ACE technician here, wanted to bring every bring all the people who are participating into the Zoom screen, um, and that way, if people had other questions, they might feel um, more more able to ask them. Um, and maybe we can meet some of the people who came tonight and who are interested. And then we'll we'll finish up. Um, and then one of the things I talked with Hannah and Jordana about was maybe they would also give us a few ideas for resources um, about how we might go about looking looking into these things. How do we do this research ourselves? So maybe we'll start with that. And then if people think of questions, we'll go back to them. Well, that actually, I was gonna ask a question. Um, I've so enjoyed this this presentation tonight, and I find myself often paralyzed by the choices when I am in a position where I do need something to put on my body. And I think, you know, what what should I do as someone who is not as knowledgeable about what the best choices are for me? So I think some some resources would be great for for many of us who are just sort of thinking about how we can consume less and consume better. I think the 
first thing that you can do is try to support a smaller business. I honestly think that um, that decentralizing that, that flow of money is a really important first step. It's too much if you try to take on the whole thing at once and like redo your entire wardrobe. Um, I also would suggest that you make your clothes yourself, which is ridiculous, I know, but um, but maker's pride is real. When you make something for yourself, you're always going to choose that garment over anything else in the closet. And you've, you've been with that garment from the ground up and it fits you perfectly because you made it for your own body. So, I mean, that's maybe an unrealistic answer, but if you do a little research into what are the companies that are the worst polluters of our planet, like H&M and Zara, you know, then maybe don't buy your clothes there. And when you just connect the dot of, if this garment costs $3, who's really paying for that? Usually it's a laborer, sometimes it's a child. There's lots of not good in how we've decided our clothing is disposable and cheap, and that's how it should be. So um, you might need to pay more for your garment, but you are supporting a local designer, a smaller business, and the supply chain that's attached to that is generally speaking more ethical than one of the larger companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you're also, if you're buying something that's um, made with organic cotton, for example, and it doesn't say like, you know, maybe it's made in, um, Turkey or India or something um, and you're kind of like okay so it's like one of the boxes but like who made this is it ethical beyond its content and stuff like that um, I I find it as it's not like a completely solid train of thought but um, I I usually find that if someone's making the effort with the fiber like that, um, it's usually a really good sign that they care about the other stuff in the garment. Um, if they're looking at kind of like their sources and that's important to the maker, the designer, the brand, whatever. Um, usually if there's some clue that it ticks like some of your, your boxes on it, uh, yeah it's you're gonna probably feel a lot better about like who's behind it too mm -hmm. um earlier you mentioned something about social media making it easier have you do you have you actually gone on some company's instagram site and asked them a question and felt like you got a credible yeah answer? for sure i'm really annoying <laughs> <laughs> i yeah i'm not shy to like comment and and find out, you know, like, oh, what's that made of? Or, you know, and mostly like companies are, you know, they're pretty proud to answer when it's like, you know, something good and they'll want it, they'll want to post about it or or get back to you right away. And if they don't, if they're a little shady, it's like a good red flag. So it's just kind of like a good, <laughs> I mean, they might just be really busy too, but um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I find Instagram really helpful for that. And also, I think with people's websites, people are putting a lot, like the trend has been much more towards transparency recently. If you see even with like huge brands that are kind of like got their little transparency thing going or whatever, but you do, you do generally find a lot more info in on a website than you used to, like in the about section and your like kind of like policies and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I, I find that helpful. That's a good, ho hopeful signs. Yeah. Hopeful signs. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you would like us to know? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? I hear someone asking, but I don't see. I had a question. Please. Um, hi, Hannah. Hi, Jordana. Thanks for joining us. Um, you said something earlier, Jordana, that was so simple and impactful that I hadn't ever thought of it that way, which is you can't really throw anything away. It always goes somewhere. Um, 
And as we all try to, um, you know, be more mindful of, of the items we're buying for clothing and textiles, we're often replacing something that we owned when, when we weren't as mindful or, or thoughtful about these. And um, how do we think about the things we already own and what's the proper thing to do with them that, that's not harmful? Yeah, well, I, do, I get to share with you um, a small list of resources that we put together that includes educational websites that either vet other companies or teach you about regional textile systems. And there are a couple of entities on there that pick up donated clothing and worry about that for you, either get it back into a recycled system of some kind, but definitely the effort is to keep it out of landfill. So um, one of those companies like has collects all over New York City and has collected since it's founding more than 20 million pounds of clothes. And that's, you know, really, really awesome. But the secondhand market is actually part of the sustainability conversation. Like you, you can shop in a secondhand store and you're keeping a garment living longer and out of, out of that disposal nightmare. Um, for things that you already own, they can be repurposed too. You can get creative. Like you, Ben, happen to be a creative mind and a designer. And so, you know, what can you make that into? It's, I think it's about extending the life of these garments as long as possible and learning things like mending or um, there's a wonderful author, Katrina wrote about who, her second book is about like how to fall back in love with clothes again that you already own. And so she over dyes them and she mends them and um, she alters their fit if she picks it up in a, in a secondhand store. So um, she gets creative about the ways that she interacts just to extend the life. Yeah. Something I do with old clothes that's like, um... Granted, it's not something everyone's going to do, but I know a lot of you out there are creative, um, is I like to shred them and use them for filling. <laughs> so, and like other things I'm making. So my dogs, for instance, sleep on like beds that are filled with like all my shredded rags. And that's nice because it's like washable and I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. and if you look at, it's funny, like looking at antique, um, I guess from all over the world. I'm thinking of like this Japanese futon I was looking at um, a while ago that was like full of rags that was like done the same way as my top bed. And I'm like, yeah, I guess maybe one day I'll work up to a mattress full. And that's kind of cool, you know? Then it's not going anywhere like awful. You have to be cheaper ideas about how to reuse your unwanted clothing don't you think yeah like yeah. the future programming all over this like there's all <laughs> <laughs> all these shakers because it's you know exactly what they and when we did a previous program on textiles i um had found a passage that listed all the things the shakers had to weave and make just for their own communities which included the burlap in the barns that they kept feed in all the way through the sunday dress clothing because shakers actually because they had a communal effort, actually probably had more clothing than many of their peers um, because they had this sort of almost industrialized way they could work together to make a lot of fabric. Mm -hmm. But for the average person who wasn't in a Shaker village, it would have been virtually impossible. Um, but anybody who's involved in that weaving is not gonna let you throw something out by the time they, <laughs> they've spent uh, hours doing it. They're, they're gonna patch it. They're not gonna throw it out. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's lots there. Um, I did promise that somebody asked, is linen a better environmental buy than cotton? I don't really know. It's not really my area of expertise, like all the technical aspects of different fibers. Jordana, mm -hmm. sure. do, do you have any? I, I think it's, in some cases, yes. I think it uses less water than cotton. Um, I also think looking into where the fibers being grown um, also because like there are certain countries that produced a lot of linen. Why did they do that? Because it grew well there. Why did it grow well there? Because it was part of the ecosystem that was there. So it would require less resources just generally. Um, I think I would have to, to really answer. I'd have to do some research to really make sure I was correct. Um, but I do think that linen is 
is um, easier on the environment than cotton. Thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, thank you both so very much for this. I feel like I learned a lot and I will be thinking of things differently going forward. Um, what, we talked a little about the resources we have. If you go to the Shaker Museum website and on the green hero page that says summer series, if you click on that, um, that's our summer series page. And this video will be available on that. And I'll be putting up a little button that will have a download. So um, Hannah and Jordan and I'll get together to put together a list of those resources. And if you're interested, you'll be able to go to the website and get it. And while you are at the website, we hope that you will notice some of our future events coming up. Um, next week at about the same time about, um, we will be talking with Mark Streeter from Nelson Bird Waltz Architects, Landscape Architects, who are doing the design around the future home of the Shaker Museum in Chatham, New York. They did a lot of research into Shaker landscaping um, and he'll be sharing that with us next week. Um, and we have also um, uh, this Saturday, if you're local to Chatham, we have the Strawberry Shortcake Festival happening at the Crowland Park just outside of Chatham. And it's free to attend and $10 for a serving of shortcake. So if anybody's nearby, please join us. We'd love to get to meet you in person. Um, and there's a whole summer full of other activities that I'm not going to uh, list here, but I hope you'll go to the website and see them. We'd love to have you join us. Um, and I think that is all that I have. So um, if, unless anybody has any other questions, anything left? So uh, Hannah and Jordana, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure to get to know you. And, um, and if you haven't yet, the knitting kit by Hannah is really an awesome pattern. I am uh, in the odd moment of considering my third. <laughs> it's very addictive. I thought I was done. And then I got a call from my sister saying, I want one. So, um, so if you get to it before I can, they're still available. And um, they support the museum. And thank you, Hannah, for doing that for us. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having us and giving us a space to talk more about what we care about. And it's been really cool. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Thanks, Jordana. Thank you so much. Okay. Good, good night, day. everybody. Good night.